Um, yeah, what, what I thought I'd do is I'm going to talk about a project that I was, unfortunately, I didn't spend a whole lot of time in the field on, but I got to do an incredible amount of data analysis. And it, it's actually, I think, really interesting. Um, we've all heard about white nose, and that, I think, is, you know, you hear white nose, it's something that's affecting bats, but what's really significant is that, you know, it seems to be about 90% of the bats in every hibernacula die as a result of it. It takes about three years for that to happen, and it, it's a significant effect on the ecosystem, at the ecosystem level. And this is, oops, um, so six million dead through 2012, six million dead bats. And, it, and that number is something that you think about and it's, you know, how do we count bats? Um, we talked to Gerda Norquist and I asked her how many bats are in Minnesota? She refuses to give an estimate because they're hard to count. They really are, but these are, you know, the number of dead bats through 2012 and it's another seven more years. 2012 we were through here and now we're all the way to here. How does it spread that fast? This is a little brown bat, but the hibernacula is actually up here and on the 600 kilometers it is the distance that it moves. So that's how you can get that kind of spread. These are probably human. Okay. And in Minnesota, we've got four bat species that are affected by it potentially. Um, the northern long-eared bat gets the most interest because it's listed as threatened under the ESA. Um, so that species, and then tricolored little brown, and or little brown is the second most uh, big brown, and tricolor is just relatively rare. I highlighted the Sudan mine because I'm going to come back to that in a little bit. That's the largest hibernacula in Minnesota, but about 2,000. Uh, little brown bats, another eight to ten thousand, or sorry, northern long ears, another eight to ten thousand little brown bats hybrid out there, and that's based on um, Gary's estimates. 2015 is when the project I'm going to talk about started. That was right before White Nose Syndrome hit Minnesota. Um, and then the effect here in Minnesota, uh, no northern long eared bats that I would have sucked on tree analysis. We're seeing in the 2019 survey of the Sudan mine. We did pick them up acoustically. So they went into there. And, and part of the issue, I think, is that the bats can go where humans can't. So the areas that they can survey, they found none. And then this year, um, they decided not to do the survey. So, so what we did, we, we were not after the hypernacular. We were after the effects in the summer on, on, on roosting. Um, and so what we did, I, I say we, it's a, kind of a royal we because, like I said, I didn't do much of the field work. The Forest Service was involved, some of those people are here. Uh, DNR was involved as well. And it was a large project um, that Rich paid through the DNI, DNR and I uh, put together. And this is a spatial extent of where we captured. So essentially across the state, we missed out at 1,200 bats and we put transmitters on some of them. One of the things that we did see, so here's northern long-eared bat, 37% of captures in 2015, but down to 9% in 2017. So we were probably picking up some of the effects of the white nose syndrome. Um, the other issue that complicates this is most of the captures were in the northern part of the state. There, there are more um, northern longer bats in the north. And big brown bat that is a species that was taking its place. So the mist netting uh, captured in mist nets, it's actually surprising me. We had zero mortalities out of all 1,200 bats handled, none of them died, which was unexpected. Um, and then one of the reasons we did this was to understand the reproductive cycle. 
so pregnant vets, um, most of the time pregnant, uh, started to have lactation in early June and then continued until uh, mid to late July. Um, we put the transmitters on because we wanted to go to the maternity roosts um, and find out what they were like. And here's an example. We found 234 uh, maternity roosts. Um, and this is one that wasn't an aspen tree. Um, heights range from 0 0.2 to 2 meters high. So, and what most of the time, they were in a crevice or cavity like this, three quarters of the time. So, something that you can see, and then uh, sometimes in loose bark and sometimes uh, on broken branches and trunks. Um, the other interesting thing, and, and this is more frequently in, in our database, the data that we collected than elsewhere, females were switching roost trees every other day, even when they had young. And it, it's a little bit less than every other day, but they carry the young to roost to roost. And I think the next, no, not the next, but we'll look at that again in a second. Uh, in terms of trees, northern long-eared bats are a generalist species. They range, as Gretz pointed out, but they range from the southeastern U.S. out to the west, up north. And we didn't know what species of trees they were using. Um, and it turns out it varies. Our sample size was large enough that you can really see a pattern. Oaks in the southeast switch into maple and aspen as you go north. And then as you go even further north, mostly aspen trees is what they were using. Um, and mostly deciduous. In, in, the, in the west, for example, um, South Dakota, the Black Hills, most of their roots are in conifer trees, uh, pines, and that's the trees that are present there. Uh, in terms of size of trees, um, what we looked at was roost trees and then random trees nearby. So you wouldn't expect necessarily a lot of difference between these because you are only going 100 to 200 yards and most away from the site. Um, but what we did see even then was that the roost trees that were picked were a little bit larger than the random trees that were, were seen, especially with smaller size plants. And that makes sense because it takes a while for a cavity or spot for a roots uh, to develop. Oh, largest tree, that, that's the range here, 10 centimeters up to 110 uh, centimeters in BBH. And in terms of characteristics, again, as you might expect, the roost trees were often declining or dead because that's where you find the cavities and things like that. Um, now, so we had a broad range in location from southern up to northern and so this is obviously not northern. Um, but it shows what we would do. This is a mist netting site. We'd have three mists net, mist nets typically. And then after they were, the transmitters were on, we would track them to where the roost trees were. And so this would be like a cluster that they'd be moving their young back and forth to um, 30 meters, 100 meters apart. Here's another cluster, and then, uh, one more cluster of roost trees. And, and so they, they do that. One of the things that's important to consider too is that these transmitters last about um, uh, a week to 10 days, just because bats can't carry very large batteries. And so they're, that, that's how much the area that they used in that time period could be a little bit large. Um, they, not too bad of a slide, but they, they pick high tree canopy for roost trees. They never used a leaf tree in the middle of the clear cut in the whole time that we, all the locations. And, this kind of illustrates that for southeast Minnesota, there's a lot of farmland, and, and let's say the, the 50th percentile had 20% tree cover for the entire ECS, uh, the Paleozoic Plateau. When you look at random locations around the roost trees, it had about 75%, and roost trees themselves, the 50th percentile is over 80% tree cover. So they're picking. Uh, 
tree with dense canopy covered areas. This is northeast Minnesota. And the pattern was there, but there just isn't the agriculture <coughs> around. Mid, the mist nest site and then cluster of roost trees. And the same pattern here. The difference is that because this random look, the entire section is not over here because it's all forested. <coughs> Even in the forested area of Minnesota, they were moving and choosing to roost primarily in areas of high tree cover, if they had the choice. We did this um, spatially, you know, if we, if we look at, you know, back this, if we look at this 10 percentile line, well, the minimum, the 10, the 25, and the 50, if we plot that spatially, and this is using the land fire um, satellite imagery, where the variable came from. If we plot that spatially, we can see that relatively large part of northeastern Minnesota is suitable for, or that this is a minimum that they can use. And we pick up things like the iron mines, the Seven Beavers area. They're not, the predictions are they're not going to use that based on what we found. And then the 10th percentile, you start to see a little bit more go out in the 25th and the 50th. And this surprised me that there, there's not as much cover um, in a lot of this area relative to what they were picking for roost trees, this 82%. So maybe it's not that surprising. Um, but in terms of management, so this is a slide I got to fix this one or work on this one and come up with some other metrics as well. So I use the FIMS and the STANS databases and said, where are the roost trees compared to where the forests are? And this is for aspen stands. We had enough um, roost trees and aspen stands so we could do this. Half of the roost trees and aspen stands were greater than 50 years old. And what is it? Most of them are greater than 80 years old in terms of the stand age. The, the issue with this is apparently the stand age is not the best potentially variable to use. And I need to look at stand age and like the all lands cover or wood volume is another one. But the pattern is going to be there, I believe, is that we've got the bats are selecting areas that are older than the matrix on the landscape. Here, we had we to combine all the other cover types, so hardwood and conifer. If you look at the rest of the cover types, it's actually the age classes of bats are selected similar to what's on the landscape. So it has potentially uh, something to say about how they're managed. Um, the second part of the project, acoustic detection, you heard a little bit about that earlier today. Um, and I'll go through a few things. We actually had 100, 214 locations, again, throughout the state, most in the north. These are the different bat species in Minnesota, minus one. And little brown bat, most common in terms of the overall number of calls. And this is the big brown bat. One of the things with acoustic detection is that if you use automated programs, there's different programs that come up with different results. And that's what you see here in the different bars. So Kaleidoscope is one program, so that is another. This is with Anabats detectors, and this is agreement between the programs. And the main thing that I would point out is that there is a consistency. It's not exactly agreement, but it's relatively consistent. And they can draw those bars a little bit differently. The other thing about acoustic detection with the programs is you can't identify every call. So if we picked up 80, well, maybe depending on the month, but average you could say 80 to 100 calls a night. About half of them could be identified as species, and about half of them uh, you can't ID them. 
there's not enough information. Oops, sorry, I towards it. This is the consistent pattern that you see. And this is, I should say, it's a little bit different in the sense that we're, uh, we've got um, the detectors are sitting in one spot for four nights. If you don't put them off for four nights, you don't get a, a good pattern or more. And they're picking up about half the size of this room. So that's the volume that they can hear. Um, when you do that, this the little brown bat, 80% of the time you pick up a call. And 20% of the time there'd be no calls tonight. About 20% of the time you get an average one call per night. And then this is about 30, and then there was times where you get greater than 10 calls per night. Um, and the pattern that was consistent with Barry was the um, numbers, because little brown bat were most common. In terms of what we picked up, and, and this to a degree shows that. So little brown bat, that's one call per night half the time. You get up to here, five to 10 calls per night, about 30% of the time or more. And then the silver haired bat was the second most common in the big brown. And the others were relatively rare. But regionally, and this is what you would expect based on the literature we picked up, uh, the proportion of silver haired and especially big brown bats was higher in the southern part of the state than the north. Okay, here's an interesting. It's a good thing done, though. Um, Sudan mine, hypernacular. Um, 2,000 bats stay there. And what we think, I set up to 500 kilometers earlier for the little brown. Northern long ears don't seem to go as far. So if we got 2,000 bats right here, and they go 60 kilometers, what does that mean in terms of density of bats that we would expect? A lot of text here, but if you follow it through, so we've got 2,000 bats in the mine, <laughs> arbitrarily, because it's probably an undercount. And then add some more for other hypernacular, come up with 5,000 bats. 2,500 um, 2, are 50-50 sex ratio, which is what you would expect. Mean maternity roost common size, that, that's what we found in our roost. So about 50 females <laughs> in maternity roost. And that means that 2,500 divided by 15 is 166 colonies. And <coughs> the home range that we had was about seven hectares. And so seven times 166 is 1167 hectares, or 12 square kilometers. The area of sand is greater than 80 years old in northeast Minnesota that spins and spans is about 500 kilometers. And the total area of the circle is 11,000 kilometers. So what this really says is that <coughs> roosting habitat is not limiting for northern long-eared bats right now. And that, you'd expect that. These are estimates prior to white nose. And after white nose, yes, there's a lot more room there. Right? Anytime you do exercises like this, spatial patterns and distribution of stand, they will use younger stands, which means that this isn't the need is less than this probably, and different cover types. But reproduction is still critical to population recovery. And that's what we need to know how to increase it. So future, uh, we set up some bad houses for, primarily for monitoring, seeing what would come to use them. Interesting work, I'm, I'm looking at humans and their effects. On a railroad, one night in September, we had 2,300 calls of silver-haired silver bats. I only had one detector. I wish I had one a kilometer down the railroad to pick them up the second time around and know that it was migration. Uh, one of my graduate students, she's picked up 300 to 400 insect species in bat diets. And this is from the 300 bats that we captured and had to dump. And then we did a project with an undergrad student, bats on the UMB campus. That was a lot of brown bats, big brown bats that we picked up there. 
So that's kind of where we're at. And did it contact? You can take a couple minutes for questions, Ron. If there are any. Yeah, just real quick, why, any speculation on why the bats switch trees, you know, the... The, the thought for switching trees is that they, they've got little parasites on them, and so they move around so that the parasite burden is not as high. And you know, it's, there's little bat bugs are called, not bat bugs, but bat bugs. <laughs> <laughs> little tiny red things. So and that's the thought. Okay. It could be anti-predation too, but there's not much that's going to take up way out there. So at this point, no specific management implications that we as foresters need to be thinking about or land managers kind of maintain status quo? The, the, well, the, the critical thing, I think, <laughs> is there, we know their population is down. The problem with any rare species is where is that species in maintaining enough areas with potential roosts? You know, because, and, and especially like one of the guidelines right now, don't cut trees in the summer during the, within a known uh, roost area. That's something that I personally think should stay in place. If, if we do know that bats come back to the same places. So if the ones that were there before survive white nose, then it's probably good to leave that roost tree. Biologically, if they lose a roost tree area, they're going to switch to somewhere else. But you don't want to put additional stress on them. That's my personal opinion. Yes? You had mentioned that the white nose syndrome killed 90% of the bats. Mm -hmm. Do the other 10% continue to survive and rebuild the population or slowly perish? So far, they continue to survive. There seems to be two things. One is like a genetic resistance aspect to white nose. And then the other part is the white nose fungus itself it has a very narrow thermal tolerance. And so these bats seem to be hibernating outside of the area where the white nose can um, persist on the bats. So those are the survivors. Mm. All right. Thank you, Ron.